I'm going to tell a story about how I fell in love with oysters. Uh, eating an oyster is one of the most responsible things that you can eat from the sea. Um, food is a need, something we do to satiate our hunger, to provide nourishment, um, to fill our bellies. But eating an oyster is an experience that's unlike anything else that you can find in our food universe. Um, we all just came back from lunch, so join me. Close your eyes. Imagine you're, you're at that oyster bar, and you're, you're slurping an oyster off that shell. The, the first thing that you get, you get this brine, this punch of the sea, and as you chew into its flesh, it releases this kind of buttery, organic goodness that you taste, and then as you swallow it, you left with this mineral-like taste, or it could be florally, or it could be nutty, or it could be fruity. It all depends on the specific growing region where the oyster came from. So um, I got involved with oysters back in 2011. I took a job on the BP oil spill doing the damage assessment from the um, coast of Louisiana all the way through the panhandle of Florida. And uh, through that process, I got kind of like a sneak peek, a, a look under the skirt, if you will, at everything that was happening in the Gulf, the Gulf oyster industry. And as luck would have it, um, one of my field partners was a guy named John Brawley, and he was from Duxbury, Massachusetts, where he operated an oyster farm. So there we are, we're on the back deck of this um, oyster boat in Mississippi, and I confess to John that I'd never shucked an oyster before, and he was offended. Um, we've all met that person that's probably a little too passionate about something. You ask them a question, and they give you a five-minute answer, and so you have another question, and they give you a ten-minute answer. Well, that was John, and um, after that day where he taught me how to shuck an oyster, I just remember being hooked by them, infatuated. Um, I found myself eating oysters anywhere I went on vacation. I started collecting oyster knives. I would go to oyster bars and get t-shirts and hats. Um, and I started reading books about oysters. And I was surprised what I found. When I started learning about the history of oysters, I discovered that US history and the history of the oysters are woven together. Um, when the first Dutch settlers happened upon um, what we know as present day New York City, the Hudson River estuary was the most prolific oyster grounds on the whole planet. Um, there were about a quarter million acres of oyster reefs all within the Hudson River estuary there. Um, the first food carts in New York City probably weren't hot dog carts, they were probably oyster carts, and if things had gone differently, we'd call it the big oyster and not the big apple. <laughs> but by the 1920s, um, unchecked sewage from, from you know, urbanization and over-harvest, um, the, there was nothing left of the, the oysters in that region. So they did what they've always done. They just go somewhere else. So we went down to the Chesapeake Bay and we started pillaging those oysters. And by the 80s, the same could be said for the Chesapeake oysters. And when you look at the blueprint of what happens with oysters, it's the same story no matter where you go. You start with a bountiful resource that's thought to be limitless in supply. Because the resource is bountiful, the price is low, so people are incentivized to remove it at a far accelerated rate. Then you reach a tipping point where it's no longer scarce. And because it's not scarce, it's worth more money. So you're further incentivized to take it. And then what you're left with is nothing. And the natural response to nothing is we have to learn how to farm. So here in the state of Florida, Apalachicola produced about 90% of the oysters that were coming out of the, the state, which represented about 10% of the national supply. Um, but all that's trickled to a halt back in 2020. They, uh, the, the Florida Department, sorry, not the Department of Ag, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission imposed a harvest moratorium on oysters within Apalachicola Bay until 2025. And I realized what was happening here in our state was the same thing that we'd witnessed happening in the Hudson River estuary and in Chesapeake Bay. Um, oversupply and environmental degradation had effectively closed 
the book on, uh, on an industry. And around that same time, there were some interesting things happening with the Florida legislature that govern the, the regulations surrounding submerged land leasing. So I decided I want to try to be a shellfish farmer. So I started looking at what it took to get a lease uh, here in Florida, and I discovered it's not a whole lot. It's like $75 an acre, which is stupid cheap, right? Um, but what I didn't realize, it was very difficult to, um, to cite them properly, to, to get a lease in an area that doesn't um, affect, you know, differing user groups, right? We have commercial fishermen, we have recreational fishermen, we have people like to water ski and jet ski, and we have people like to kayak. So after I participated in this marine spatial planning exercise four times, uh, my fifth application was finally accepted. And so um, I was now, you know, sitting in a pretty good spot because I saved up all this money from being an entry-level scientist. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so I had no money to start this sharp, expensive rock farm. I didn't even have a boat. So I did what a lot of people do when they find themselves in a situation like that. Um, they find somebody much smarter to help them. So I enlisted my wife's help. <laughs> so together... So together we formulated a business plan and we started uh, knocking on the doors of any bank that would listen to our ridiculous pitch. They're like, you're going to grow an oyster from Tampa Bay? You think it's going to be good? Is anybody going to eat it? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> what type of revenues does your business have? You know, what, what type of assets do you have to leverage a loan? They're like, nothing. <laughs> Eventually we found somebody that was willing to give us a loan and uh, so in the summer of 2019, we started building out our dream, and we built an oyster farm right here in Tampa Bay. So the way that process works, we purchase seed-sized hatchery. That's the term we use for juvenile oysters. Now, these things are the size of, of cornflakes. They're really small. Um, we take them, and we stock them out in these mesh bags that have like a four-millimeter sized hole. As they grow and they get larger and larger, two bags become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16. We have an exponential growth problem on our hands. They graduate into larger and larger sized mesh bags. Through that process, we're grading them, handling them, sorting them. Um, we have a mechanical tumbler that, that does a lot of that and helps with the sorting process. Um, and then once the oysters reach a size of about three inches, we distribute them here in the Tampa Bay area. We've been featured in local restaurants. We also sell direct to consumer to, to folks that come and pick them up from our garage. And then we also do shucking events. We'll show up at weddings and breweries and special events and we'll sit around and drink beer and eat oysters and we'll talk about aquaculture. So, um, this industry in the state of Florida is still on, in its infancy. Um, there are about 100 growers in the state, and it's, um, we're decades behind other regions like the Chesapeake, where oyster farming has been commonplace for, for decades now. Um, but we're learning that the, the benefits of shellfish aquaculture are innumerable, right? We are creating something where there was nothing. We are reducing the pressure that's put on our wild stocks. We're creating an ecosystem. The ecosystem services of an oyster cannot be understated. They provide habitat and um, nursery grounds for juvenile fishes and crabs and other invertebrates. Um, they also do something with, um, with enhancing our coastal community's ability to mitigate against storm risk, right? The wave attenuation properties of reefs help break down coastal storm surge. It might be a key with helping us fight climate change here in the future. So the most exciting part of this business is being part of this growing movement towards uh, local sustainable seafood production. The United States is the number one importer of seafood in the world. 
and we import far more, we import far more than we can produce. Um, increasing our domestic production is going to help provide food security for, for coming generations. So the agricultural revolution happened on land maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago because we realized that farming was a far more efficient means of producing food than gathering it and hunting it from the wild. Um, and we're amidst another revolution that's occurring, except for this time, it's happening in our oceans. Um, with our wild harvest capture fisheries remaining relatively static since the 80s, all of the growth that has come in the seafood sector has come in the form of aquaculture. So aquaculture is the key to, to meeting the, the future demands of the planet. Uh, in 2020, for the first time in history, global aquacultured seafood uh, outpaced that of our wild capture fisheries. So the, the tide has already turned, if you will. Um, this second wave of seafood production is kind of our second chance to get it right with the ocean, because let's be honest, we messed it up the first time, right? So the ability to produce seafood um, sustainably and responsibly in a manner that preserves and enhances our ocean's natural ecology is going to be the, the, the key to making sure that, that we get it right this time. And uh, our two-acre farm in Lower Tampa Bay probably isn't going to change the world, but uh, it's a good place to start. Thank you.